Today we're going to be talking about the cardiovascular system, the heart. Hi, I'm Vivian. I'm Michael. And I'm Lauren. And we're doing the heart. The heart is located in the mediastinum. The mediastinum is an area and not a cavity. There's no serous membrane found here. The heart is medial to the lungs and it is superior to the diaphragm. Next, we're going to be talking about the apex. The apex is the pointy part of the heart that branches out towards the left. It is closest to the wall of your chest. Next, we're going to be talking about the coverings of the heart. The heart is covered in the pericardium, which is made up of two layers, the fibrous pericardium and the serous pericardium. The fibrous pericardium is a tough outer layer and it is made of dense connective tissue. The serous layer is made up of two different layers. You have the parietal, which is stuck to the bottom of the, of the fibrous pericardium, and then you have the visceral pericardium, which is also known as the epicardium, and that's directly covering the heart. All of this is in the pericardial cavity, which is filled with serous fluid. We're doing the layers of the heart. On the outside here, we have the epicardium, the outermost layer made of simple squamous epithelium and loose connective tissue. And then in here we have the myocardium, which is made of cardiac muscle, which is branchy striated muscle cells. That is uninucleate, which is one nucleus, has an intercalated disc, and desmosomes, gap junctions, and which are used for strong contractions. We cut that. Gap junctions for strong contractions. And then we have within here we have the fibrous skeletal of the heart is a network of collagen fibers and elastic fibers which anchors valves and vessels and then on the inside here this layer is the endothelium no nope. wow is the this layer here is the endocardium which is simple squamous epithelium and it uh, its function is to smooth uh, blood flow next we're going to be talking about the chambers and large vessels of the heart the atria which are the two upper chambers receive incoming blood from the body. There are various structures in the atria. There's the intraatrial septum, which divides the atria into left and right. The auricles are pouches that increase volume of the atria. Then you have pectinate muscles, which are the ridges inside of the atria. The fossa ovalis is a scar that is left over from a hole we had in our hearts as a fetus. Then there are veins that enter the atria. Into the right atrium, you have the superior vena cava, which brings oxygen-poor blood from the body above the diaphragm. And then the inferior vena cava brings oxygen-poor blood from the body below the diaphragm. The coronary sinus brings oxygen-poor blood from the heart. And then in the left atrium, that gets blood from the four pulmonary veins. There is the two right, the two left, and those bring oxygen-rich blood from the lungs. The other chambers in the heart are the ventricles. The ventricles consist of the intraventricular septum, which divides it into two cavities. The trabeculae carnae are the muscle ridges in the ventricles, and the papillary muscles provide tension and anchor the valves. Then we have arteries that are leaving the ventricles. The right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary trunk, which carries blood to the lungs. The left ventricle connects to the aorta, which, ta which takes oxygen-rich blood to the body. Alright, this is going to be the blood flow through the heart. Uh, we start off with the superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus. And this is all oxygen-poor. It moves into the right atrium and then into the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle, the pulmonary semilunar valve, and the pulmonary trunk and then the left and right pulmonary arteries until it reaches the lungs, and this is where it's gonna become oxygen rich. And from the lungs, it's gonna move into the left and right pulmonary veins, through the left atrium, the bicuspid valve, the left ventricle, and the aortic semilunar valve, and the aorta, which will move either to the heart and then back to the coronary sinus, or through the body, through the superior and inferior vena cava. Okay, we're gonna be talking about coronary circulation. First, you have the left coronary artery. 
Then you have the anterior interventricular artery, which supplies the anterior walls of both ventricles and interventricular septums. Then you have the circumflex artery. It feeds the left atrium in the posterior of the, length, the left ventricles. Then you have the right coronary artery, which feeds the marginal artery. And the marginal artery feeds the lateral part of the right side. Then you have the posterior interventricular artery. And that feeds the remaining of the posterior ventriculars. And then you have collateral circulation, which is the additional routes of travel for blood to get into particular parts of the heart. Next, we're gonna talk about veins. First, you have cardiac veins, and they collect blood from the heart. Next, there's a great cardiac vein, and that drains the anterior side of the heart. Then there's a middle cardiac vein, which um, drains the posterior interventricular sulcus. There's a small cardiac vein, which drains the right inferior margin of the heart. And then there's a coronary sinus, and that is a collection of veins joined together. Properties of cardiac muscle fibers. They are striated and they use sliding to contract. We'll cover the microscopic anatomy, which has intercalated disc, and intercalated disc has a gap junction, which allows calcium through the cells, and desmosomes, which uh, allow strong connections between the cells. And together, these allow functional syncytium, which has all cardiac muscle cells be together as one. Uh, the energy requirements, uh, it takes up to 10 times the amount of mitochondria. It only does aerobic respiration, so it needs oxygen. And it uses anything as fuel, fat, protein, or anything it can get. Next, we're gonna be talking about the contraction of cardiac muscle. It contracts in a similar manner to skeletal muscle. With the sliding filament theory, cardiac muscle has slower calcium channels, so they take a while to open up, so it stays depolarized longer as opposed to skeletal muscle. The heart either contracts as a unit or not at all. Skeletal muscle requires neurons to stimulate it. Some cardiac cells are autorhythmic, which means that they will automatically contract and depolarize by themselves. And then the absolute refractory period for cardiac muscle is 250 milliseconds, and for skeletal muscle, it's one to two milliseconds. Next, we're gonna be talking about the heart physiology. The extrinsic conduction system sets the basic rhythm for the rhythm in the heart. The autorhythmic cells have an unstable resting membrane potential and are constantly depolarizing, and when they hit the threshold, they do a contraction. The excitation sequence goes through a series of steps. First, the SA node initiates contraction and sends this message out to the whole heart. Sinus rhythm is when the SA node is back in control of contractions. The vagus nerve does parasympathetic innervation, resting in digestion, and it influences the heart to slow down at about 75 beats per minute. Both atria contract when the SA node fires and it travels down and activates the AV node. The AV node holds onto the impulse to let the atria finish contractions. This sends the impulse down the atrioventricular bundle, which is also known as the bundle of his. The bundle of his carries the impulse down to the ventricles and splits into the right and left bundle branches. The right bundle branch sends off to the right atrium and the left bundle branch sends off to the left atrium. The AV bundle and bundle of his beat about 35 beats per minute. The Purkinje fibers are responsible for activating most contractions in the ventricles. They pull on cordae tendinae to get ready for heartbeats. Next, we're gonna be talking about rhythm defects. First, we're gonna be talking about arrhythmia, and that is a miscommunication between the atria and ventricles. Fibrillation is a miscommunication between the cells. Junctional rhythm is when the SA node fails and the pace is set by the AV node. Ectopic focus is when some place other than the SA node controls the heartbeat. And heart block is an abnormal heart rhythm where the heart beats too slowly. The extrinsic innervation of the heart, modifying the basic rhythm. The autonomic nervous system has a sympathetic nervous system, which speeds up the heart and increases the force of the contraction. And the parasympathetic nervous system slows the heart rate and decreases the force of the contraction. And the medulla oblongata the cardio accelerator center speeds up the heart and the cardio inhibitory center slows the heart rate. About the electrocardiography or the EKG. You have 
three deflection waves. First, there's a P wave, and the P wave shows when the atria is contracting. Next is the QRS complex, and that's ventricular to polarization. And then last, you have the T wave, and that is when the ventricular that is ventricular polarization. Then you have intervals. The PQ interval is atrial excitation to ventri ventricular depolarization. And last, you have the Q and T interval, and that's how long the ventricles take to contract. Next, we're going to be talking about the cardiac cycle. The terms to remember in this are systole, which is contracting, and diastole, which is relaxing. The events that occur during the cardiac cycle are as follows. The SA node fires and causes a P wave. The atria enters systole and starts to contract. Blood goes to ventricles and then they contract and the AV valve closes. Ventricles keep squeezing and they start pushing on the semilunar valves and they enter a ventricular ejection phase. When the ventricles run out of blood, isovolumetric relaxation happens, which is when the muscles relax, but they're not changing in volume. Finally, the atria refills, the AV valve opens, and the heart enters the quiescent period. We're going to talk about heart sounds. First, there is the love sound, and that is the sound when the AV valve closes. Next is the dump sound, and that's when the semilunar valve clo is closed. Next, there are four sites on the chest to listen to. The first is the aortic valve. The next one is the pulmonary valve, the mitral valve, and then the tricuspid valve. And then last, there's a murmur, and that is the disruptive blood flow, and basically that's stuff that shouldn't be there. Cardiac output definitions. End diastolic volume, or EDV, is the amount of blood ventricles contain after the atria contract. End systolic volume, or ESV, is the amount of blood ventricles contain after they, cont uh, they contract. Stroke volume is how much blood is pumped. Cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped in one ventricle in one minute, and cardiac reserve is the difference between resting cardiac output and maximum cardi cardiac output. Next, we're going to be talking about regulation of stroke volume. Preload is how much cardiac muscle stretches before it contracts. Starling's law states that more preload equals more stroke volume, because if there is more blood in the ventricle to start with, the stronger the contraction will be. Preload is increase because more blood is pumped when the contractions are stronger. Contractility is how hard the contraction is not due to stretching and can be affected by epinephrine and norepinephrine. And finally, afterload is the blood left over after contraction. People with high blood pressure have higher volumes of blood left behind because there's more pressure in, the, in their aorta so it's harder to pump blood out. Next, we're going to be talking about regulation of heart rate. The autonomic nervous system can help direct heart rate. So you have a sympathetic nervous system, and that releases epinephrine and norepinephrine to increase heart rate. The parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine, which lowers the heart rate, and then vagal, term, vagal tone occurs when the parasympathetic nervous system is dominant, and it keeps the heartbeat around 75 beats per minute. Baroreceptors detects backup in the atria and causes an increase in heart rate. The heart rate can also be affected by chemical regulations. Some hormones that affect the heart rate are epinephrine and thyroxine. Epinephrine increases the heart rate and contractility, and thyroxine increases the heart rate and potentiates epinephrine and norepinephrine. The ions involved are high calcium levels, which make the heart beat faster, Low calcium levels make the heartbeat slower. High sodium levels stop the heart because it blocks transport of calcium. And high potassium stops the heart because it stops depolarization. High potassium stops the heart because it stops depolarization. Other factors affecting the resting heart rate goes down as you get older, and the more fit you are, the slower the heart rate is. Last, we're going to be talking about clinical problems. First, there's tachycardia, and that is when the heart beats faster than 100 beats per minute. Bradycardia is when the heart beats slower than 60 beats per minute. Atherosclerosis is hardened arteries, and congestive heart failure is when the heart can't pump enough blood to keep up with the body's needs. Next, we're going to be talking about congenital heart defects. Cyanotic is when the baby is blue when it comes out. 
Tetralogy of Thalet is when the pulmonary trunk is too narrow. Transpos transposition of the great vessels is when the vessels are backwards, so the aorta is coming from the left and the pulmonary is coming from the right. For acyanotic, you have the atrial septal defect, which is when the hole in the wall that divides the atria doesn't close properly. The ventricular septal defect is when blood mixes between the ventricles. And then there are age-related problems, so the heart valves thicken as you get older, cardiac reserve declines, and cardiac muscle becomes scarred.